454 returns and then rebuilds the wall. But we forget the order of how these things happen. We read about Daniel and all his visions and the angels coming to give the interpretations and we get all the, the crazy stuff about uh, the Prince of Persia contested with me. I got here three weeks earlier. But luckily Michael came and knocked the Prince of Persia out so I could get here and give you your interpretation. Here you go, Daniel. I'm an angel. I'm a watcher, by the way. Here's your interpretation. And we as Christians, we go, okay, that's a little weird. I'm just going to skip over that and just keep on going. <laughs> and we don't even think about the idea of principalities and the demonic realm as well as the angelic realm. We don't see the war, the principalities that govern us. When you go back and look at the Tower of Babel, we only think about the language mixing. The Bible says that when God scattered people, yes, he confused the language because there was nothing that they could do, but he also says he set up spirits to govern over the nations. What does that mean? That means that there are certain demonic angels who God has given permission to be a principality over those people and keep them blinded. But over Israel, he placed his top archangel, Michael. Michael is assigned to the nation of Israel. There's something special about it. So... All of these verses now. So look at James. James being the first, first, uh, the first chapter or first book of the New Testament. Let's look at that real quick. If you have your Bibles, um, I'll show you a couple of verses here. They're pretty cool. Uh, let's see here. Any questions, by the way? <laughs> okay. Watch this. From James. A slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad. So it couldn't have been, couldn't have been the Jewish, the Jewish diaspora yet. The dispersal after 70 AD because that hadn't happened yet. And this isn't prophetic. So he's talking about the dispersed ones who have who didn't come back from Babylon. Not everybody came back. Enough came back that they rebuilt the temple. Enough came back that they rebuilt the wall. Enough came back that they reestablished the southern kingdom's roots with Abraham, with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in the end, they still rejected the Jewish Messiah. And God still had to judge them. But that judgment came much later. So we go back to this. Who are those people? Where are those people? Remember that the moment that Israel ceased to exist, the northern kingdom, and they went into the nations as God told them he would do, and they lost their identity as a people, within two generations, they had become Gentiles. Just like we would consider ourselves Gentiles. Now, I do think it's going to be kind of neat because of the way DNA works. I have, a, I have a kind of a fascination with DNA and just the science behind it is amazing to me. Have you heard about the thing on TV where you can find out your genetic background? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, Pastor Mike did it. And he found out that he has... Um, he has... traces of, of Levite? He has kind of like a priestly... I don't want to speak on it. There's some time where he realized that the people that he's from, predominantly, there was a very high uh, rate of, of Levites. And it didn't say he's Jewish or anything like that. They just found it to be interesting that he's a pastor and that his family line comes from uh, kind of a priestly... Right? But he's not Jewish. Okay? Um, but yes, I'm aware of those things, right? And I think what's really neat is is that if they can trace and trace the human genome and go all the way back and come to the conclusion that we all came from one woman, as the Bible says, if they know that, then I believe when it's all said and done, I don't know if it'll be in the millennial reign, I don't know if it'll be before, during, or after never, the tribulation. Let that get out. I don't think they'll ever, you know. Oh no, but here's the thing. I believe one day you'll know. I believe that because of Israel's rejection of Jesus, of God during this time and his judgment upon them, that was how we get through a spirit of adoption 
Because remember, it's only one tree. There's no Gentile tree that is saved in the end. There is only one family of God. In the Old Testament, he says, my, I make my new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. He makes his new covenant with these two groups. And that's when he brings the two trees back together. So you have to ask yourself, you're a grafted in, adopted child of God. And you get all the blessings and you get all the covenants and promises of God just like he made with his bloodline people. And so you can see all the promises that are due to you because you know what? You got his last name now. And even more than that, he put his a spirit of promise on the inside of you. He gave you the Holy Spirit to indwell within you. And he said, you know what? Even though my temple has been destroyed... In my place, you now are the temple of God. And I reside now in men. And so now you have to ask yourself, so which of those two pieces have you been adopted into? And we know that as of today, unless someone knows a breaking news story that I didn't hear about on the way coming over here, has the nation currently in the Middle East known as Israel, have they pronounced Jesus Christ to be the Messiah and they have now made all of Israel to fall under the Bible? Have they? No, that hasn't happened yet. And in fact, the people who are in Israel right now that we call Jews, they're not even the Jews directly descendant of Benjamin and Judah. Their bloodline has gone. The majority of the Jews in Israel today are part of a movement called the Zionist movement, which the Zionist movement is Khazar Jews, Jews who converted around the Middle Ages in like Russia and Europe. And those people were driven back to the Holy Land in the turn of the 20th century. And it did bring about the creation of the nation in 1948 that we now call Israel. But those people living in Israel are not Israelites. The Israelites have been dispersed all through the world that God might redeem the world. Because guess what? We don't know who is and who isn't. You might, you might have a little bit of... Of Israelite in you. And you don't know. But it doesn't matter. Because even if you did, it wouldn't get you any more. Or it wouldn't cause you to have any less if you didn't. You still get the banquet table. He's still coming back for you. Because his bride that he's coming back for. Who he has left to prepare a place for. Is his bride Israel. And you've been grafted into Israel. You've been adopted into Israel. And so when he comes back for Israel. It's time to get your grub on baby. <laughs> But we've got to keep these terms. We've got to keep them. We've got to be succinct with them. And we can't conflate them and miss, miss uh, when we're reading. We think we're talking about one group of people when it's actually another group of people. Because let's look at another New Testament passage here. Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Look what he says. Now, if we look on the... Now, well, watch this. Let me get this first. So the first book written in the New Testament is James. And James writes it to the 12 tribes of Israel, spread out and scattered abroad. Okay? He doesn't write it. The first book of the New Testament written is not written to a bunch of pagans. All right, here's another thing. Let me, let me, let me, let me see if I can come back to rabbit trails before I forget to come back. The pagans hated the Jews. Paul was like Paul was like the Albert Einstein. Paul was like the um, who's the guy crippled up? Um, he, he's the he, Paul in the first century was the Stephen Hawking's of the Torah. He was uh, Gamel's top student. Paul had the Torah memorized. And God, he even says, I, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he goes, and, and God comes in and says, Paul, or Saul, why do you persecute me? And he chooses that guy to go 
preach Jesus to a bunch of pagans? Now, I don't think the pagans did know the law. But Paul clearly did. And it was important because who Paul, I believe, the reason the church grew so rapidly and quickly was in 700 years, the Israelites or the former descendants of the kingdom of Israel, the oral tradition would have passed down and been like, look, I know we're living over here in Greece, but uh, act right because, you know, we come from the old northern kingdom. Now, you know, look, your great-great-granddaddy was part of the group that, well, I read one time in, in one of the prophet scrolls, it, they hoard themselves to the nations. Well, that's why we're here now. We can't go back to the Middle East. Paul was the intermediary. He was the difference between the new and the old. He was bringing those two together. Absolutely. And when Paul came and said, like in Romans, he said, I speak to those who know the law. He was talking to people who had a familiarity with it. The reason 3,000 came in at once and 10,000 came in at once. Man, you go preach a five-minute sermon and 10,000 people become a part of the gathering of the assembly of the ecclesia? And we go, oh, yeah, that's Pentecost. That's Holy Ghost. And we, and we go, oh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's Holy Ghost fire right there. Or is it that these people knew that they were living under the curse? That they had been divorced by God and they could not go back. And the good news was the curse is broken and you've got a new husband. And you need to worship him because he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's coming back especially for you, just as it says in the prophets. And you had all of these people. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some of the evidence for that. First Peter 1. From Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those temporarily residing abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, the province of Asia, and Bithynia who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, being set apart by the Spirit for obedience for, and for sprinkling with Jesus Christ's blood, may grace and peace be yours in full measure. Now watch. Uh, move your stuff for me for a second. All right. So, let's see. I'm looking at this upside down, so just be patient. All right. So here we have Tower of Babel, and here we go. We're moving right across, and these are the Phoenicians. Here's the Egyptians. The All right, we're along, and I'm looking for the, I'm looking for, here we go. All right, so, so watch. So this goes all the way back right here. And this is my Israel line. Okay, mm -hmm. These are the descendants that came from the Tower of Babel, and they traced it. And here you have the time of the judges. Here's Samuel. Here's where Saul comes in. Saul, David, Solomon. Solomon gets judged. The kingdom divides. Rehoboam, Jeroboam. Okay, So we follow this around. Uh, Rehoboam, we continue to go over here. We see that this is where this goes down into Nebuchadnezzar. This is the Babylon. right? But this one... This is where it ends right here, and this is, goes into Assyria. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they go into Assyria, but if you notice, Syria splits at Sargon's reign, and it goes into these two lines that come out when the Persians ultimately defeat the Babylonians and let the Jews go back to the Holy Land. But if it continues, you notice that the Persian Empire is a kind of a big deal, and then you get here to Macedonia. Now look at this. You've got Egypt, Syria. What do you have right here? Cappadocia. Asia Minor. Look at this one. Bithynia. Greece. Ephesus, Galatia, Colossians. All of those were churches in Greece. So the northern tribe of Israel, I can directly on a, on a well, this is, you can, you can tell, this, is, this ain't some just overnight project right here. But you can trace the northern tribe into Assyria and you can trace them into the very places that Peter is addressing in Scripture. Now these would have been descendants of these people. 
But their, their, their oral traditions would have carried on. And so one of the ones here, now if, that, if, if I'm right, and I'm excited because you know what? I could be wrong. But I'm excited nevertheless. And, if I, and, and look, I, and I'm humble enough to say, if I'm wrong, I'll admit I'm wrong. But, but this is excitingly fascinating to me. Especially today when I opened this up and I, I said, wait a minute, I know Bithynia and Cappadocia and Asia. I said, why did I know that from? And I said, well, let me go back to the places that I remember. And I started doing a couple of verses that I had bookmarked. In my, and when I saw that, I said, that's who Paul's writing to. Which, to me, lends credence to the fact that if James is writing to former Israelites, and now Peter is writing to former Israelites, then I'm, they knew where they were. And when they said brothers and sisters, they really meant it. These were long, distant brothers and sisters. But they being Jews, coming from the southern kingdom, they saw it as, hey, at one point, these were their descendants, their fathers, were a part of Abraham and all the promises that come with it. And so this was a homecoming. That was the gospel. That was the good news. Is that the curse has been broken. But I think we tend to read it so much to us and we have made it church versus Jews. Ready, fight. And somehow that if you're not a Jew, that, you know, well, then you're a part of the church. Because the Jews, they reject Jesus, so they're not part of the church. So you got the church and then you got the Jews. And we go, okay, that makes sense. And, but then, but does it? Because that never really made sense to me. Because if, if God had a problem with the Jews, but Jesus is saying he came only, because I thought the house of Israel, surely Israel, Jews, that's what they are today. I'm thinking the same things. But they're not the same things. So remember, when we talk about Gentiles, we're simply talking about non-Jews. That could be anybody. That could be Chinese. That could be African. That could be North American. That can be South American. If they are not part of the rabbinic Jewish practices. Samaritans were half-breeds, but I believe, and I haven't got there. Somebody asked me that same question today that I was talking to, and I had to do a little more research on it. Um, help me out. The northern kingdom set up their capital in the city of Samaria. But if you were a Samaritan, where are you from? Because you have the Sumerians, which predate the Babylonians, right? The Sumers, right? That's the Sumerians. That's where we get a lot of, a lot of folklore. Um, but I'm trying to think, I, I, what I'm going to have to do is kind of the same way, is find Samaria? the Samaritan story on the Bible. The woman at the well. The woman at the well. What the, what the Samaritan have to do? She made a point of saying. That's, that's a very interesting point. And what's interesting too, now that I'm sitting here thinking about that, at that whole story, he focused on her and her relationships. He focused on her. That fact, she had multiple husbands. But then he ends by saying, "But the water I give you was living water." So I don't know. I mean, that's look. That is really, and see, this is what I expect. I expect now, kind of looking at this. From this perspective, yes, that's right. Which, of course, I mean, look, I really, I really believe there is the, the, there's the potential there for us to take the the New Testament into. I mean, I even think it's going to change some of the prophecies that have never really made sense. I haven't got that far yet. My my precious mother in law, who loves and has, and is well studied on revelation and, and end times prophecy started asking me questions. I was like, listen, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I said, let me get there, you know. <laughs> but I got excited to see. Now here's the thing. Now now go back and read Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, 
Go back and read them and think that every time he's talking about... Because remember, the English translation that Paul used all the time is sin. But if you use the definition of sin according to the Bible, then you've got Paul saying over and over and over again, stop transgressing the law. And he's taught now, go and read it and don't think that he's talking to just a bunch of pagans. Now watch, why would a sect of Jews that Paul calls the Judaizers or the super Jews come in and want to demand circumcision? And Paul has to say, don't worry about if they... If they uh, tell you uh, you're not supposed to be keeping the feast days or, or the moon, the moon cel uh, celebrations and all that stuff. Well, of course, the modern church says that he's telling them, you don't have to keep those things. You don't have to worry about those things anymore. But what if that's not what he was saying? What if under this circumstance he was telling them not to go into rabbinic Judaism, but that come into the way, which is the way God's going to redeem all of Israel, and follow the way, the truth, and the life. And by doing that, don't worry about physical circumcision. That's not that matter anyway, because my one said the circumcision of the heart. Because right. these people would have been Gentiles, but they would have known as descendants of Torah keepers, they would have known that that was what Father Abraham did as an old man. Circumcised himself and the men of, that were with him. I mean, it's one thing for that to get done when you don't remember it at six days old. It's another thing to do it when you're 75. <laughs> and you're well aware. You know what I'm talking about? So, of course, Paul's going to be saying, oh, come on. You guys are former Israelites. You guys are now redeemed. The curse is broken. You don't need to now go back to the law. That's been satisfied by the man Jesus Christ. And he's coming back for you, bride of Christ. Because that's what you hear over and over and over to the churches. Over and over and over. It's not that God's law is bad. It, will it ever become good to murder? Will it ever become good to steal? The law as given is good. And it's absolute. And, and I do know this in Revelation, it says that when Christ returns, the ones that stay with him are the ones who keep the commandments and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Not one dot or tittle. He kept confirming it. He said, I come to fulfill the law. Absolutely. Now watch. He fulfilled the law in that he lived it perfect. We would have to fulfill the law because we broke it by paying the penalty to make the law whole again. So not only did he fulfill the law by keeping it perfect, but then he turned around and paid all of our debt to restore the wholeness of the law, to make it fulfilled once again. So he did it, lived it and fulfilled it in his personal life so he could be the perfect sacrifice. And then he died in place of everybody else's punishment and paid the price that we should have had to have paid. But he did it collectively one time for all forever. It's done. It's finished. When he said it was finished, he really meant it's finished. The law, the curse of the law is broken. Everything that you could not enter into because you either didn't know God or you had been rejected by God, it is broken now through the through Jesus Christ. And it's through the context that we're sitting here talking about today. You will get a fuller story. You'll get a fuller understanding of what we're talking about. Is the whole thing. I mean, it's everything. And look what he told the Jews. He says, I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. You can't reconcile somebody back. When a husband and wife reconcile, they put their differences aside and they make happy. 
But when they have irreconcilable differences, you come to an impasse and divorce is the result. And so God said, I have now given you through the blood of Jesus, the ministry of reconciliation. Go get to reconciling other people who don't yet know about the fact that I have paid the price for them. They're no longer, they don't have to be outside of my family anymore. They are my bride. Jesus was the lamb slain from the beginning. This has always been his plan. Eve was in Israel. I mean, Eve was inside. When God made Adam, Eve was in, in Adam. It doesn't say that he reached out and grabbed some new dirt and made Eve. It says he reached into Adam. That's a picture of Israel. The one kingdom united. But Eve came out of the one kingdom to become two. But in the relationship of marriage, Genesis chapter 2 says that a man and a woman shall leave their father and their mother and the two shall become one flesh. That's a picture that I've always thought that Genesis 3.15 was the first messianic prophecy. That right there. Why do you think marriage today in our world is under attack? You think it's just because some, some homos want to get married? And ain't got nothing to do. You want to know what this bathroom thing is about? Because he says he created them male and female. He didn't create them cisgendered and transmasculine and, and all these other. He created them male and female, and he brought them together in an institution called marriage. And what God has brought together, let no man separate. So you can't redefine marriage. Marriage is what it is. So we don't have to get our panties in a bunch, but you know what we need to do? We need to understand that in our relationships, that's the physical manifestation of God's eternal plan of being with us forever. And if that be the case, I look at my wife differently. I pray she looks at me differently. I pray our children learn when they see us, they see the eternal plan of God to redeem mankind and to redeem them specifically into his family. Let's pray, guys. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we have the freedom, the liberty to study and to, to seek your truth. Lord, we know that your word says that in the end, you will send strong delusion. You will send that delusion, Lord, so that people will believe the lie. Father God, you say that the people who be want to believe that lie, you'll help them believe the lie. But for those who seek and respect and honor your truth and the knowledge of your truth, Father God, I pray that you always remember us, your children, as those who just want your truth. We want to stand for your truth. We want to more than just know who you are, Father. We want to we want a boldness to tell others about what you've done for all of mankind. We want people to know that their sin is done, that there is no more curse, that your law is no longer an issue to keep them separated from you. You are coming back for your bride and they can be a part of that number. Amen. Father God, I just pray that as we, as we dig deeper into your word and we look at this and we seek to understand and know that, Lord, this is not for just for knowledge's sake. Lord, we don't want knowledge that puffs us up. Lord, we want knowledge that leads to understanding. We want understanding, Lord, to become wisdom so that we can know a, a, a spoken word in the right time that can set the captives free. We want people, Father God, we want to know and, and hear your Holy Spirit prompt us to say what you would have us to say to redeem your children. We desire to be used to reconcile your bride back to you wherever she is in this world. And we thank you, Lord, that you have, by a spirit of adoption, given us your Holy Spirit, a promissory note that one day that we too will be like the angels, sons of God. You've already given us the right to call ourselves sons of God. And we thank you to be a part of your family. We thank you that you've grafted us into that one tree. We thank you that we've become that one new man. And Father, we pray that these mysteries, that Father, you would continue to reveal your truth to us. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank you. Amen.
Now I didn't get to put everything. I, I didn't get to put everything into uh, into a presentation, but um, uh, yes, I believe that there's a, a offering. Um, but I've got I've got a couple hundred scripture that that for you to kind of see how all this plays out. Um, but I would strongly encourage you to get one of those uh, on the Bible app, the U version. Bible app and get in get you get into a um it's, listen by the way just for the church here in Slidell I put Pastor Mike's notes on the Bible app every Sunday so the following Sunday when Pastor Tom preaches the message that Pastor preached from the week before you can save Pastor's notes in your phone and have Pastor's notes from the Sunday service at White Dove and Harvey, when Pastor Tom preaches, right there, I, I put those on there every week for you guys. So if you have devices, it's you version. It's the little brown Bible. You just have to have an account. So sign in on your computer or on here, which means you just got to have an email address. You version. Like just the letter U? Uh, Y-O-U. And, um, and you click on event. And when you click event, you hit live. And in this area, because I put in the zip code of the church, in this area, that those notes will pop up and they'll be there for a week. On if you have an Android phone, you just hit the button save un, save as note, and it saves the entire notes onto the cloud, and you can pull them up at random. If you have an iPhone, you have to hit share and then email them to yourself. But then you have them in an email form. It's not as convenient, but they haven't upgraded it enough for the uh, iPhone users. So it's phenomenal. And everywhere you have that on your any of your devices, tablets, computers, wherever, it, it you have it with you wherever you go. To the test? I did, yeah. I did. I sent it, yeah. So everybody who was on that list, I sent it to. Uh, I will, um, let me see real quick. I'll tell you when I sent it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hope to see you next week. Let's see. Sent. And let's see. That would have been uh, the 18th was last week, so it's, uh, 11th, 12th, 13th. Yeah, and interestingly enough, oh, here we go. May 5th, um, I sent that to five recipients. CECE37 Rusty at Yahoo.com. Uh, Joanne Rayborn at Yahoo.com. Jazzy at BellSouth.net. HD Dobbert at Hotmail.com. And DowFeed1 at Yahoo.com. Which one? Okay. Oh, how do you spell Alfred? A L F R E D. I have two E's, so I, I misspelled it. I'm going to send it right now again. So look in your email. Came, the, the title of the email was Worldview Link. Obviously, you wouldn't have got it because it was the wrong email address, so I'm going to resend it right now. Oh, the word. It's a it's a software that you can download for free for study purpose. It is uh what the that the the word? No, you have to go to their website, theword.net. That's the actual website, and it goes on your computer. So like that goes on your laptop or your home computer. No, no, it's pretty intense. I mean, like you can pull up. It's got uh, commentaries, dictionaries. Um, I, I use it for like a comparative study, so I'll have the King James open, and then I'll have I'll actually have the Hebrew Bible open. Now I can't read it, but when you hover over it, so if you know a verse that you want, you hover over it, and it tells you what the Hebrew word was. So it's kind of a neat way. But if if you don't want to do that, it's got a, it's got a Strong's Concordance, U version. 
U version is for the phone. And it's a Bible yeah, it's got all the versions of the Bible on it. Look. I was using Bible Gateway. <laughs> hey, Boogie. So that's the, and you have um, all your highlights, all your bookmarks, all your notes. It's actually a social network. So like if you're friends with people, they can see what you're studying, what you highlight, what you so you can be like, oh, I love that verse. You know, it's kind of neat to see. Um, all so you go to the Bible. So you, you it's like it's all out, it's outside of your your. Correct. You're not taking up any of your memory because, on your phone. Because I mean, phone. I just got a message saying I had too much stuff. So look, <laughs> look at all these versions. These are all versions of the Bible. Now here's the other cool thing about it. Watch this. Um, English Standard Version. Okay, so the first letter of Peter. It'll read Chapter to you. One. It'll read to you. So Peter certain the versions. Jesus Christ. So I get up in the morning. I go in the bathroom. I got a little speaker, just a little plug-in, and I'll go to my Bible plan, and I'll play it. I'm an auditory learner anyway, so if I can sit there and listen to something, I can pick up on it quick. So. Shaving, showering, getting ready, brushing my teeth. I gotta sit in there reading. It takes a while for me to be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. Yeah, well, if I hear it, it sinks in almost immediately. Yeah, but it's cool because now I can plug it in. I fall asleep to it sometimes. I'll put it on my nightstand and I have my phone charging, and I just have the Bible uh, playing, kind of a little bit low, and I'll just lay there and I'll listen to it. And then sometimes I'll, I'll be like, I, I don't even remember falling asleep. In this you rejoice. Playing lectures while you were sleeping? You have been grieved by various I could sleep through class and take a test the next day at 8. I'm going to add that R in place of that E. I didn't send it. And she referred to Jacob as a father. So That's Jacob good. So we, so what we need to trace on here mm -hmm. is where did Samaria come into, where did it come into the Jesus. southern kingdom? Can you go backwards from Jesus to find it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't think here's. That would be the easiest way to go backwards from Jesus. Well, let's see. Uh, 200 BC. Here we go. Zero. Right, so that's Jesus, the death of Jesus. Born, or when he died? born. He died in 30, 33. No, it stands for Anno Domini. It's Latin. Anno Domini, which is Latin, and it means in the year of our Lord. But people never really talk about the history of the first 33 years of the AD calendar. So everything after 33 AD would, in fact, be after death. Right. Because they say, well, this is before Christ. Now, in but schools I mean, the today, years they don't the use. Most important one. Well, in schools, they don't use BC and they don't use AD anymore. What do they use? They use BCE, uh, before Common Era, and CE, and CE Common Era. They had they had to take it away. They had to strip the religion out of it. Mm -hmm. Now it's just kind of a I natural. Mean, I, I would have never known that. So yeah, so here's well. here's uh, so we would need to follow. I guess what I'm still unsure of is so she was she was a Samaritan woman, right. correct? So where were they from? There's no Samarita. Mm -hmm. Samaria, huh? And Sumeria would have been a city. So I don't know when Samaria became a nation. That's what we gotta find out. Okay. And then we find out how it was folded in. Yeah. Because <laughs> I guess the key point is Jacob, they consider Jacob their father with some who blended together at some point in some separation. At right. Some point. Right. You don't mind. Yes, sir. Don't stop. Oh. I, no, 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 no. Leave that. Leave that. But I need to. The pack? Because I need to make a decision while you're out. You don't mind. Thank you. No, I do. All right, dude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Because they had a problem because they had a conflict because the Jews had had nothing to do with America. But if something happened, I try to think something happened because they didn't they didn't have nothing to do with it. Well, listen, I, they've told, I've had three different people today bring that particular story you up. Study I know. You gotta, if that, that's a confirmation, you got to study it. And so I'm like, well, I'm not sure. That's a, that's a really good point. What I want to find out is, you know, if you say you're an American, right. you're from America. Yeah. Right. I don't know of a Sumerian nation or a country of people known as the Sumerians. Yes. You think maybe they changed the name somewhere down the line? Now, you had the Sumerians, which was S-U-M-E-R-I, but that's not the same as Samaritan. But they were taken over somewhere, and then they changed the name? It, it very well could have been. I don't know if it came out of the Persian Empire. Empire yeah. And this is, so you have, this is like all of Syria, right? Because here's, here's the time, here's Jesus' birth. Okay, so Samaria is... Within the Palestine territory. Okay, so that would have been the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. So, are these people that came, are they part of the people who came back from the Northern Kingdom when Assyria? It was the capital of the Northern Kingdom. It was a city. Like in Judah, when I saw Ecclesia, oh, yeah. That's my thing. And in school, I'm looking at these, like, what do you, what do you kind of like this for? But now, I like the revolution, I like, you know, with this, that, the okay. Civil War, right. Vietnam, I'm very fascinated with. It's something that I don't know why, but I'm so <laughs> Vietnam. Now, watch I know this. So much about Vietnam with the war. This is totally unrelated, but check this out. So, um, so here's the deluge, right? The flood, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. So, here's Shem, okay? And so this is Noah, right? So let's go back up here. So here's Noah's line, right? So Noah, and then here's the flood, okay? So Noah has uh, four, uh, four sons, mm -hmm. and yeah, I know. I'll tell you about that later. So watch. So this is still Noah's line, and Noah dies in 1998. BC, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but now watch. This line is Abram. Abram was born 1996. Two years, remember, the numbers get smaller. Mm -hmm. Two years after Noah died. Okay? But this is Shem. All of this is Shem. So from the time Abraham was born, Shem was still alive. Mm -hmm. The book of Enoch says, that Abraham or Abram was sent to live with Shem and Shem taught him all the ways of God. And the book of Enoch says that Abram walked with God from the age of three until he died at 150 years old. So the idea that people, how many times have you heard this preached? Well, you know, Abraham was a polytheist. He worshiped a whole bunch of uh, false gods and God called him out of, No. He had been with, according to the book of Enoch, which is quoted in Jude, uh, in Jude and, and Second Peter, it says that he learned all the ways of God from Noah's son, who, oh, by the way, had been on the earth before the flood to know how co-up it was yeah. and would teach him the ways of God because that's what Noah was. Noah was a teacher of righteousness, and it's the Shem line that we get the continuation, Shem, and we get it all the way down to Jesus. How about this one? Esau, mighty hunter, right? About to die of hunger. Comes in, his brother's got some stew. Mm -hmm. And says, he says, well, give me your birthright. He says, well, what good's a birthright? I'm about to die anyway. And you think of hunger. Mm -hmm. In the book of Enoch, it says that Esau had beheaded Nimrod, the king of the world. And Nimrod's men had been chasing him. And Esau thought he was going to die. So when Joseph said, give me your birthright. He said, well, what good is a birthright going to do to me? I'm going to die tonight anyway. And I'm, we don't have that part. <laughs> it's not inspired, but it's an interesting piece of history. I'm going to have to go back and see if I can see any sign of him riding or chasing She likes to look up stuff, too. <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect, baby. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Pastor Trish, as always, brother, you enlightened. 
Like well, you try to make it fun. Yeah. Try to make it fun and, and hope yeah. that, uh, yeah, no, man. and hope that in, in making it fun, yeah. it incites you to get back and, and read a little more. Mm -hmm. Look at things with a fresh eye, you know? Exactly. Get some self control. Exactly.